Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We are so excited to be hosting the Tech Interactive on today's webinar with the American Muslim Community Foundation. My name is Muhi Khwaja, and I am the co-founder of American Muslim Community Foundation. Uh, today on our program, we are elated to have on a few donors from the Tech Interactive who give through AMCF, um, Munira Haider and uh, Munira Shamim and Amr Haider. Uh, we also have on Michelle Maranowski, who is the curator and exhibit developer at the Tech and the president and CEO of the Tech Interactive as well. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, we will be going into uh, sharing a little bit more about the Tech Interactive and American Muslim Community Foundation. But I wanted to um, just start out by sharing that AMCF as a community foundation really focuses on supporting organizations all across the country based on the interests of our donors. Um, and our donors are giving through their faith identity of being Muslims and want to connect with local and national organizations right in their backyard that are creating impact all across the country, whether it's for basic needs or their alma mater or for education and kids programs, the Muslim community cares just as much about these American institutions as much as our own faith-based institutions as well. Um, so I've had the honor of knowing Munira and Amr for over a decade, uh, and they've really been part of every nonprofit organization that I've been blessed to be part of in my nonprofit journey. So I know that Amr and Munira are very kind and generous and committed to the philanthropic landscape of American institutions. Um, and it's fantastic to see that they've been supporting the Tech Interactive for many years as well. So at this moment, I would like to pass it over to Amr and Munira, welcome. Thank you, Mugi. Thanks, Mugi. So um, shall I get started? Yeah, why don't you start? All right. So uh, the tech has a very special place in our heart, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, all the folks working for the tech, thank you all for your service. I mean, you know, when I came to the Valley 20 years ago, it's one of the first places I visited uh, as a young engineer and was excited to see, you know, it's, it's an icon in, in the landscape of uh, iconic building in the landscape of uh, uh, Silicon Valley. So, and then when we had kids, um, it was even more special because there's so many awesome programs at the tech for kids and a place to take kids. Our journey is not only just being a techie and being involved in Silicon Valley, but it's, uh, the tech also has a very special place uh, for us because uh, way back in 2011, the tech had a uh, traveling exhibit called the Islamic Sciences Rediscovered Exhibit. And I was very excited when I heard this and I said to all our friends, we're gonna get these tickets and go there. But then there was some confusion that maybe the tech is gonna pull that exhibit because there was a lot of hate mail uh, that came from the community to the tech saying, why are you showing uh, this uh, Islamic Sciences? You know, what's the point? And of course it's fact-based, uh, you know, Islam has a lot of contribution towards science. But, you know, the, the tech really stood for the tech. <laughs> there you go. The, the tech really uh, stood its ground and said, look, this is something that uh, is fact-based. We've committed to it and we're going to see it through. So the tech actually put together uh, a whole program uh, to engage the community uh, by bringing in uh, different scholars and um, inviting the larger community to come and, and really hear firsthand from, from uh, Muslims and from technologists and historians. And I was, you know, they brought in folks like Reza Esalan, who's a, who's a writer, and, and some other uh, key, Wajah Ali is another speaker. And uh, that's how our relationship started. So we're super committed to the tech and its, 
and its views and and the leadership. So thanks guys for for what you what you all do. And of course we visit Briarcore every year. We'd watch the IMAX and we'd go see the kids stuff and we did the 3D printing stuff. So uh, so we're very excited for all the work you do. So Amr, there's part two to this story. Yes, that is. <laughs> our, our relationship with the tech became even more special when uh, fast forward one or two years from this incident of the 2011 Ex Islamic Sciences Revisited exhibit, uh, we reached out to the tech for support for one of our causes. Uh, Amir and I have initiated a foundation to support research around uh, achondroplasia, which is a genetic condition. Our son is affected by it. And we were looking to do our own awareness event. Um, and we, we just, we wanted to be in a kind of space that would be science inspired and where our scientists who are our guest speakers would also, you know, just really, you know, thrive in a, in a place that spoke to their, uh, uh, their work. And at that time we reached out to the tech uh, for support, um, very heartening response. They, they gave us the huge uh, meeting room that's right next to the ticket counters on the first floor that seats a couple hundred people at a tremendously discounted rate. Each one of our guests got a free ticket to visit the museum. And, you know, fast forward 11 years, our, our relationship with the tech is still going strong as it did um, back in the day. Um, over the years, we have learned that the tech is more than just a brick and mortar, and it's more than the sum of its parts, the, the, uh, the parts that meet the eye. Uh, the tech offers a lot of programs beyond its walls to Title I schools. Uh, the tech showed amazing resilience in the past one year when we were all sheltering in place. And, you know, to my knowledge, they've been um, reaching out to schools and you know sending kids for science uh, experiments and science scientific learning. So I've just seen the tech really uh, change, evolve, and meet meet the challenges of the times over the years. And for, for that, I am just um, I almost feel that if if I didn't contribute to their journey, the loss would be mine. You've said it so eloquently, Munira and Amr, and really want to you know, share my appreciation for all of the fantastic work that you've done and have been able to uplift through AMCF. And you, know, you were the first family that opened a donor advised fund with AMCF. So you, know, you guys are pioneers and see the need in the community um, and just watching your support grow for so many institutions across the country um, has been really inspiring. So thank you so much for all of the fantastic work uh, that you continue to do, and especially in your support of the Tech Interactive. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Well, yeah, I wonder if I may have a moment, just a quick moment. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, introducing Michelle Maranowski, she is, again, the curator and exhibit developer at the Tech. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. I, I thank you so much. I, I just wanted to add a few um, comments to Amr and um, Munira's comments about uh, the exhibition Islamic Sciences Rediscovered. Uh, so I have been on staff at the Tech for over eight years, but uh, prior to that, I would come and visit the Tech just as a uh, you know a community member. And I very clearly remember my visit to Islamic Sciences Rediscovered and how, um, how it opened my eyes to a whole um, area of sciences that I was not aware of. Um, there were uh, things in there that I, that I just found so beautiful and wondrous, like the idea of a, like the water clock. I, I, and at that time I was making my own water clock, believe it or not. Um, the idea of um, the uh, medical, um, the medical implements, I very clearly remember the scalpel that was uh, developed by an, um, a, a Muslim uh, physician to do eye surgery. And the design of that uh, implement has not changed over the many, many, many hundreds of years, you know, like it was such an efficient tool and so well designed and built that we still use it today. 
Um, and all of these ideas of the, the physics was also in that exhibition too. So I just wanted to add that as a community member, that particular uh, exhibition made a big difference um, to me uh, personally and professionally, because at that time I just thought to myself, no, the fact that the tech was so brave to bring this traveling exhibition in, this is a place that I would like to work for. So that was a that that exhibition actually made a big difference to me. Thank you so much for sharing that, Michelle. Um, you know, I believe that values matter a lot. And the fact that the tech interactive at that time decided that they were not going to uh, give in to the rhetoric that the community was uh, sharing speaks volumes of the leadership and the integrity of the institution. Um, and I think that the entire community was able to benefit. And now here you are many years later still working at the tech. So just from that one exhibition, um, so much wonderful things have happened for the tech interactive. Um, I would like to now introduce uh, Katrina Stevens, she is the president and CEO of the Tech Interactive. And earlier this month in Ramadan, we also had a five fast minutes episode with Katrina to shed light on the Tech Interactive. So if you take a look at AMCF's social media, you can find our five fast minutes interview. You can go to YouTube and search five fast minutes Tech Interactive and find their episode there as well. I highly encourage everybody to learn more about the tech through uh, that and through the presentation that is yet to come. So Katrina, take it away. Well, so first I wanna thank you, Mohi, and to thank um, Manira and Amr um, for just you know, supporting the tech for um, years and being a great partner for us. And I wish that I could take credit for that exhibit. Um, it was an exhibit that was before my time um, but I'm really proud uh, of the history uh, of, the, of the tech and in, um, in, you know, like I said, supporting the community. And um, we continue to stand by the Muslim community and um, we, we have the tech interactive. We want to be a place that is um, for everyone. Yeah, we are at our heart. We are a family friendly science center, um, uh, really focused on inspiring young people to become problem solvers and to to tackle the challenges that we have in our world. That means we need diverse problem solvers. We need people from all walks of life, from all different experiences. And, and that's how we're gonna be able to, to really manage and, and to um, overcome the challenges that we have as a society and for us to you know, have creative new solutions out there. Um, the One of the things that we, oh, we're based down in, in San Jose, for those of you who may not know who we are. Um, and you can see that this kind of iconic um, you know, the Azure mango um, color scheme that, um, that it, uh, we are very well known for. Uh, let me go to the, to the next slide. So the way we think about our work um, is that really along this idea of um, wanting to take young people from this idea of spark, you know, just like a lot of our work is just around getting kids excited and curious and interested and imagining the, the, what was possible for the world. Um, the, uh, and we also know that for young people to even think about going into STEM, that they need to, um, that they have to have lots of exposure you know, to being able, before they even imagine like, oh, someone like, someone me, I could actually do this. I could try to solve a problem in the world. And then um, we have, and we have a lot of just coming into the interactive, uh, a lot of experiences are there along that. We have a, you know, an amazing TikTok campaign that, um, that has been getting a lot of traction. So um, you know, uh, young people have loved being able to talk to one another and be able to try some of the activities that we have on there. Then we have a long history of doing really about how do you build skills and confidence in young people. Uh, we, the tech challenge has been around for longer than the tech um, interactive itself. Uh, we just had our 34th year of the tech challenge. It's the longest learning, longest running engineering competition in the US. Um, and really proud to say that we, uh, we really work hard to try to, to design these to be really inclusive. Um, we had over 51% of girls who participated this past year, um, which is unusual for engineering. Uh, and uh, a high percentage of our of the students participating were coming from Title I schools. So for us, we want to really, as I said before, be the tech that is for everyone. And so we design and reach out and really make sure we're trying to, to have the opportunities for young people as far and wide as we can. Um, and then we also um, uh, uh, 
um, have things like the tech academies. So this is a place where we help train teachers to be able to, to help our kids um, to be, so we think that's another way to really have impact um, with our deep partnerships with, with the districts in the region. And then for like one of the things we really want to do is like if kids are interested, you know, like they do the tech challenge, they're really excited, or they they participated in in one of our other programs. How do we help them actually figure out how to get into a career? Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, you know, how do you become an engineer? Yeah, you know, what does that look like? There are an amazing number of jobs in the region, and we want to make sure that that young people who don't necessarily have thought of themselves as being able to have careers in these spaces, to be able to imagine themselves and to be able to skills and be able to have all the connections um, that we can help them to be able to to get on that pathway if that is um, if you know if those are careers that they want to choose. And the next. And so our big news <laughs> is that we are reopening this Saturday. Um, so we are at Memorial Day weekend. We are so excited to be seeing, to seeing people come in. Um, we uh, had a dress rehearsal. So it was fun to just, for me, because I came on as the CEO um, during the pandemic. So that the first time I was able to see kids, um, it was during our dress rehearsal and super excited about the reopening that's, that's taking place this weekend. Um, excited to just see the kids running, you know, running, well, running around, to, you know, like safely running around, um, trying out all the activities um, and just hearing from the community how excited they are to be back. Um, we um, and you're going to have all of the favorites that, that folks really, really enjoyed, you know, the tech studio, um, social robots, um, our body worlds decoded, all of these exhibits will be here. But in addition, we are opening our largest exhibit ever. Um, and I am going to turn it over to, uh, to Michelle, um, who is one of the primary designers for this, for her to share a little bit about it. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Katrina. Um, I am very much looking forward to giving all of you an introduction to our latest exhibition, Solve for Earth. We've been working on it since 2017. And as uh, Katrina mentioned, it is our largest in-house designed exhibition at 5,000 square feet. With Solve for Earth, we aim to inspire hope and provoke action around sustainability. The goals of the exhibition are, are three. Uh, number one, to seed conversations and for those conversations to move outside the walls of the interactive, to, to support problem solving, uh, and to move away from passivity towards systems thinking and action. Solve for Earth, we've designed 20 separate exhibits uh, exploring transportation, energy, water, food, biodiversity. Uh, there are several themes that we've incorporated. Uh, here are a few. Uh, the connectedness of our living systems, uh, looking at the trade-offs involved in the choices we make, uh, and then the imp looking at the impact of our individual and collective choices. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so this is an image of our connections wall, the entrance to solve for earth. Uh, connections wall is a giant immersive interactive experience that introduces visitors to solve for earth and what they will be doing when they are inside collaborative problem solving around sustainability. Connections wall is approximately 60 feet long and 16 feet high and it's very hands on. So visitors uh, manipulate the orange knobs. You can see them here. They're placed across the wall. You can see them. Um, they use those orange knobs to set scenarios and then watch as the impact of their decisions play out in front of them. Connections wall is a feast for the eyes. Uh, a favorite example of mine of something that you will see is how building density impacts transportation and mobility. So as you turn up the knob that affects building density, the buildings kind of pop up like bubbles, they pop up and you see more buses and rail lines start to operate. But turning the knob down, the buildings pick themselves up and walk away and you see more low density sprawl and more single occupancy cars. And so that's what Soul for Earth is about. It's understanding the effect of our choices and then creating a better future by making different ones. Uh, so next slide, slide three, please. Thank you. Uh, a key element of the way we develop exhibitions is to research with our community. We want our exhibits to be as well understood and as um, simple as possible. And we can't do that without 
testing with a wide variety of people. So in here you see some of the work that we did with our community to develop the Community Voices exhibit in Solve for Earth. In this exhibit, you will hear from people in our community about the changes that they're making and the solutions that they're working on. Um, on the left, you see us testing the very first prototype at a members event uh, in the Tech Interactive. Uh, we found that maps are magnets. And during this particular session, we had visitors chatting with each other, uh, chatting with us, and we collected all of that feedback. Um, and the upper image, the image above, um, is our third prototype with a variety of pucks. And then below that is the prototype closest to what we have on the floor now. All of that has been informed by our community. A slide floor, please. Thank you. Um, in this exhibit, Pick and Choose, we examine the environmental impact of our food choices. The task is to build a burrito from start to finish. And with every addition to your burrito, we share the environmental impact of that decision with you. Our jobs as exhibit designers is to convey content as efficiently and as simply as possible. With the first prototype of pick and choose, we started uh, essentially with an empty plate um, and you know, making meals with that empty plate. Um, but we found that not everyone was familiar with the idea of planning a balanced meal. In fact, kids usually don't plan meals. I know this as a mother. That meant that kids uh, could get stuck on that concept rather than learning about food and sustainability. So through testing, we learned that we could reduce the barrier to understanding by narrowing down the choices and presenting the options in a Chipotle cafe style experience. Um, this improvement allowed us to quickly move to the point of the exhibit, which is to explain that there is an environmental impact to our food choices. So that is a very quick introduction to our newest exhibition, Solve for Earth. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. And I really, really look forward to seeing you at the tech and meeting all of you at the tech. Uh, Katrina, back to you, please. Thanks, Michelle. And I will say, I um, the first time I did the pick and choose, um, and I went out for which was one of the first times I've gone out since the pandemic, and um, it it actually impacted the decisions that I made for dinner. I was like, oh, I remember that, that red bar, so yeah, that that used a lot of water and, and a lot of um, land. So I think I'll make a different choice for my food. So it does actually um, um, impact the kind of decisions that you make. Yeah. And that's what we want. Like the, the goal of that exhibit, as well as the rest of the interactive, is to start conversations and to have people think about trade offs and decisions that you make. And and um, again, to have you know, to as we design, trying to think about like listening to the community and hearing what it is that they care about, what what um, what, what they want to you know what they want to see and what they want to learn. Um, a couple of other things that we we did, like so, um, Manera mentioned, like during the pandemic, that we put some resources up. So we um, uh, put up. Uh, tech for Home, um, which has a set, of, which is still there, and so a lot of resources that were specifically de designed for families. And so we took a lot of the activities that we do, you know, that we had in the interactive, and we designed them so that um, kids could do these things at home, um, you know, with with more minimal resources. And so, like they build a, you could build a storm drain that can keep water clean when it rains. Um, it had a wind-powered vehicle to deliver something like a cupcake or a dog treat. It was actually fun because kids would post their videos after they did some of these things. Um, building a structure that can withstand an earthquake. Uh, we even had a Thanksgiving parade that involved um, uh, kids create, uh, sharing their inflatables that they designed using one of our activities. Um, so we really were trying to, to help families who um, you know, were, were carrying the additional burden of, of having to do a lot of um, you know, having their kids at home. Uh, and so like for us, it was really all about a lot of that work was digital and we wanted to have kids to be able to go back to be able to do things with their hands. You know, I, I kind of talk about it as like hands-on, minds-on learning. And so all of the, the um, and they're again, all free, but we want as many folks to be able to use these, these um, activities as, as possible or all on our, our tech at home site. And I also mentioned that we um, work with educators. And so we've been doing this for about seven years. We have something called the Tech Academies. Um, and we've trained over 4,000 educators through that. 
And through that, through the students that they've reached, we've reached over 200,000 students that way. And for us, if we can help support teachers so that they have access to this kind of you know, design challenge learning where they're able to you know, teach kids problem solving, help build confidence, obviously is one of the biggest things that, that, that teachers really found to be able to, to have young people develop. Um, that's where we'll have the longest impact over time. Um, yeah, kids love to come to see you know, on their field trips or to come with their families. Um, but having it like having that additional piece be you know, part of their curriculum and the part of their learning in schools is another way that we that we really feel like we're, we're able to make a difference in, um, in those partnerships. Um, so, you know, to share to, you know, little bits of the, some of the things that we do um, here at the tech and um, as Michelle said, super excited about folks being able to come back and a you know, we are, like I said, reopening this weekend. Um, tickets are available online and we would love to see um, as many of you as possible. Fantastic. Um, so at this point, um, you know, Katrina as the president and CEO and, you know, the one who kind of helps steer a lot of the, you um, decisions and the strategy at the tech. Um, just wanted to kind of hear from you a little bit more about some of, you know, obviously the big reopening this mm -hmm. coming weekend, um, but share a little bit more about like, what are some of the things that the community can start to expect from the tech now that you guys are reopening? Yeah, so for all the favorites are still there. Yeah, <laughs> so folks can come, come in and see those. Um, you know, on the longer term horizon, if you've been down in San Jose, there's a lot of construction happening. And so one of the things that we're excited about is that, um, uh, that we will be having an expansion. It's not going to open until 2024, uh, but that's really focusing around thinking about how do we um, continue to serve young people and to be able to help them really deeply imagine what it'd be like to be in STEM careers, you know, thinking about things like internships and additional workshops and uh, different pieces. So we're going to do a lot of work over the next um, few years uh, in, in thinking about what that looks like, you know, particularly identifying what are the kinds of careers in the region that we know that there are going to be a lot of jobs for. And how do we help young people get into those? Um, so that's a piece of, of uh, so um, it feels like we, we've spent years of really getting kids excited um, uh, and you know, engaged in, in all of the activities, whether it's their field trips or whether it's um, the work they're doing at schools or coming to, coming to see us. Um, or the tech challenge where kids you know, spend months together working together on really interesting challenges. Like this past, past one, we had one um, where it was, uh, kids use cardboard to create something that had to turn into something else using the exact same things. And the creativity was off the roof <laughs> uh, in that piece of it. But you know, then so we get kids that are super excited and we wanna be able to help make sure that we close the loop and be able to help them be able to get to um, and say like, hey, you know, you're really good at this. Uh, you know, you've ever thought about becoming an engineer or thought about a data science or going to biotech or being a social entrepreneur. Um, and so that's, those are places that we're gonna continue to, to explore. Um, uh, well, again, you know, continuing to, to keep what we're doing moving forward. I, I think the other place that we're really leaning in, we've had a long history of um, really thinking about how do we design with the community, and we're going to go even deeper on that. Like, so we are, particularly as we think about designing this new space, you know, I want kids part of those conversations. I want different, like they can, <laughs> again, kids are pretty amazing. Um, there was a design that one of the kids did where they created this um, standing desk that I'm actually building <laughs> like here I, like I need a standing desk still yeah and so I got a cardboard and it held the computer and so um so we know that young people have lots of really um strong ideas um, and creative ideas that we want to be incorporating in that but also really wanting um both the tech itself as well as the um uh, the ER expansion to be as inclusive as possible. So we're looking at increasing, making sure that we're thinking about accessibility. We're thinking about who's represented. Um, and so that when anyone walks in that they feel like I belong here. Yeah, like, there's a place for me here. This is designed for me too. And so that's a, a big piece of, of, of how we are we're thinking about the tech moving forward. For sure. And then I wanted um, you to highlight some of the partnerships that, you know, obviously in the last year, um, there've been so many great programs that you've been able to offer uh, within the community, but um, if you don't mind sharing a little bit more on some of the partnerships that have helped you through this time and also some of the longstanding partnerships that the museum has 
um, and just talk about from a nonprofit perspective, like how important those partnerships are for institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can only do this work through partnerships. <laughs> yeah, like the the um, yeah, um, encouraging young people is yeah, it really is a village, and so you want to think about who are all the people that um, have other other capacities and have, have other access that you want to be to bring in. And the more we connect with one another, the more more of an impact that we're going to have. And so we partner like we have ten districts that we work very very closely with. Um, so that's a play like we're you know, actively listening. What do you need right now? What are some things that we can help you with as you're you know, thinking about they're also reopening? Uh, and yeah, so that also, and, and they test out some of the things that, that are some of our programming. Uh, we've also worked with them, Boys and Girls Club and Breakthrough Collaborative. So other organizations that have you know, after school programs or summer programs. And so we, we um, work closely with, with a number of those folks as well. Um, we've got done some work um, and globally, you know, working with some organizations as we're starting to explore some of those partnerships and um, we have with, with um, uh, UNICEF, for example. Um, so we are you know, looking to see like um, places where people are, like, want to use some of our resources and, and, and leaning in there. Um, and so we've got a lot of partnerships with again, other nonprofits. Um, the Mexican Heritage Plaza, we partnered this past year. Um, they, uh, there's a food pickup. And so we worked with them to um, send them science STEM kits. Um, uh, so, and that was actually really, we had lots of, it was actually just fun to see for the parents to be excited to be able to take something home to their kids. Yeah, awesome. And then having kids just talk about like how it was nice to just have, you know, hands-on kinds of activities that, that they could do. For sure. Um, and then, you know, it's great to see that there's a trajectory and a strategy in place for, you know, the kids who are coming to the museum, right? Mm -hmm. It's very intentional. Um, it's being able to let them play, let them discover, let them be creative, yeah. but then also harnessing that and, and like finding that spark mm -hmm. uh, for those kids and being able to, you um, build with them and interact with them and share what type of skills they need to have in order to uh, learn more in this field and have the confidence and the resources and the tools necessary uh, to be successful uh, in this industry because you know the school systems all have limited resources but it's great that the tech is able to provide their resources to the school districts um, so that they can be of additional benefit uh, to communities and i just think it's fascinating how um, the tech was able to go from really like a local um, partner for a lot of these schools to now global through yes. <laughs> all of these online programs yeah. Um, so it's fascinating to hear the partnership with UNICEF, and I'm sure they have hundreds and thousands of schools all across the world. Um, and hopefully now the Tech Interactive is also actively engaging with these children all across the world as well. Yeah, and the pandemic, we, we had planned on being able to reach more kids, but the pandemic accelerated some of that. Um, we did a couple of virtual field trips that are, yeah, again, available on our site. And we had um, close to one and a half million kids who looked at, you know, who viewed you know, across the world, who viewed um, um, the, the resources are attached to that or, or the other two videos that are there. And for yeah. the tech challenge, we had a, we had kids from Pakistan who, um, like a team that came from there. Um, we had kids you know, literally from, from all over. Um, we also have been doing mentoring events um, where particularly for, for young women. And uh, yeah, there was a young woman from India who um, it was like five in the morning for her, I believe. <laughs> it was like you know, it was literally in the, almost in the middle of the night for, for yeah. her. She was so excited to be able to just connect with other young people. Um, she basically said that she had an, like where she was, there wasn't a lot of support for her to, to be going mm -hmm. into STEM. And um, so for us, like being able to like find those young people and, and um, that they might not be able to have access to that. And you know, that's again, that's why we, we will talk about wanting to just reach more kids. For sure. Yeah, I think, you know, nonprofit organizations like um, Girls Who Code or Code mm -hmm. Her and all of these other fantastic nonprofits um, really provide complementary services to the tech. And, um, you know, as you're talking about partnerships, those are a few that come to mind that just also do fantastic work. And, um, you know, in terms of, you know, what do you feel again is on the horizon? You talked about like the construction happening and like other things, but um, you know, 
where where are you going? Where is the tech excited about um, in the in this next year? Well, in this upcoming year, um, we are mostly just excited to welcome folks back. <laughs> and we know that um, yeah, like every, the world is kind of reopening, uh, it's, uh, but people have different levels of comfort. So one of the things we're making sure of is that everyone feels safe, you know, like that we're, you know, we're following the highest protocols and, and um, between social distancing and masks and um, really wanting to make sure that, that families feel comfortable coming back. Um, you know, especially given that kids under 12 are, are, are not vaccinated, are not eligible to be to vaccinated yet. So for us, like the first immediate thing is, is we just want, um, we want to welcome the community back. <laughs> um, and uh, and the, the thing we're most excited about for this next year really is the cell for earth, you know, that, that Michelle was kind of sharing and being able to um, uh, yeah, continue to tweak that as we get feedback from communities. But we think that that's, a, that's going to be a really unique experience. Um, and I will say, if you come in, there's a couple, there's Easter eggs all through that first, <laughs> uh, for that wall when you come in. And um, the, there's a, my favorite is that there, if you watch carefully, there's one of the figures is not so good at yoga. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> you'll see how he's doing it. And, and one is sort of, um, and there's a Yeti in there. So there's a lot of fun things to, to be able to come in and just, um, that you can keep returning to and keep playing with there. Awesome. Uh, now, the last question that I have for you before we open it up to um, the community is, you know, as a leader of this institution, um, what is your vision and plan for the Tech Interactive? Yeah, and I'd say, um, you know, part of why I was brought in is that I have an education background. Uh, and so for me, the longer term vision for thinking about the tech is how do we take the things that are really around you know, like delight and curiosity and spark and fun, you know, how do we um, you, they essentially leverage all of those experiences so that we're really helping with learning, you know, underneath all of that. So for me, that's, you know, that's like we're, we're deepening that and, and really thinking about um, and how do we do that for all kids? You know, so um, knowing, recognizing that kids enter into STEM in lots and lots of different ways. Um, so for me, that still is the, is um, like, how do we really reach the hearts uh, of kids and ignite that a spark and be able to, to be able to see, see where they're going. Um, and for us, it's like, we've had a lot of really amazing programs. We have Tech for Global Good, the Tech Challenges, the Tech Academies. And one thing that we're really looking at um, as a team is, is how do they all add up together? Yeah, and so one of the things we've been doing is just being more intentional moving forward around what the connections are across all of our different programs. Great. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to bring up as well um, is American Muslim Community Foundation. You know, we have donor advised funds and, um, you know, we have over 130 families that are participating uh, in those, but we also operate giving circles and we manage eight of them. Mm -hmm. um, the newest one is an American Muslim Women's Giving Circle. It's yeah. with women all across the country uh, who are giving $420 together, and they've collected about $17,000 as of yesterday. Um, you know, any Muslim woman can join uh, by the end of June. Uh, and if you're an ally and you just want to support, you can give to that collective pool of funds as well. Um, so, you know, in terms of um, the programs offered in uh, supporting young women, um, what would you say is like at the core of that and how we can potentially present that opportunity to this women's giving circle? Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that we do for young women um, specifically is, uh, is mentoring events. And it is incredibly important for young women to see other women that look like them um, and actually men who, who are supporting them, but who um, can hear from and get encouraged and be able to imagine that they also could be that. So one of the things I think that is, um, and again, lighter lifts are really around how do you um, create conversations where you're kind of sharing people's stories. I think that, that storytelling is often the most powerful thing uh, and opportunities for, for young girls to be able to ask you know, to ask questions um, uh, as they think about what it is that they want to do. And we need to have as many um, role models as possible. You know, so being able to figure out ways where you're getting, uh, again, diverse, um, uh, in this case, really making sure. Um, you know, and it, for me, it's like envisioning you know, a young um, Muslim girl who's in a community where she's more isolated 
And uh, yeah, is she able to see yeah, an, a woman who's in their a career further along who looks like, looks like her and you know, has similar viewpoint on the world? Um, being able to get those stories out, I think is the places you can have the most impact. For sure. And that reminds me of a few organizations like Muslim Women in Tech, Muslim Women Professionals, and a handful of others that are really in the space for that exact reason. Um, so we do have a few questions that are coming in from the audience. Um, so let me go through a few of those as well. Um, what makes the tech unique? Is there anything um, that you will not find elsewhere other than at the tech? Well, certainly our new exhibit, but I would also say um, some of the things that we have, for example, social robots, which is our most popular, um, kids get to build a robot and they learn the concept of, of coding, yeah, you know, kind of the early concepts of coding. So in a very hands-on way. So that's one that, that's very, very popular. Um, Bodies World Decoded is the, I think is the only exhibit that is using, you know, Body Worlds, um, but on top of that, putting on a custom AR experience, so augmented reality. Um, so you get that kind of tech um, overlay on top of that. Uh, and that's actually something that's you know, really unique that, that doesn't exist anywhere else. Uh, and then Cyber Detectives is another one of ours that's popular. And young people come in uh, and it really helps them to understand the digital world um, and to gather tools to, you know, but essentially they're catching a cyber criminal. Um, it's almost like a, you know, escape room kind of, of idea, um, but, but around like, you know, catching someone who's, who's doing cyber, uh, around cybersecurity. Um, and I do, I keep saying young people, but I, like before I came to the tech, um, when I, I would travel a lot and I um, always stopped at the local science center, you know, so, and we have lots of our visitors that are, um, um, all ages, you know, so like uh, we, we designed for age 18, but we, um, um, I think all of us who are kids at heart are, um, can enjoy the tech in lots of different ways too. Yeah, definitely. And as like travel opens back up, I'm sure the tourism in and around the Bay Area will bring more people to uh, the museum as well. Um, I know that it's one of the main attractions that I've enjoyed living here the last eight years. Um, and, you know, I'm a big fan of like origin stories. So would love to ask, uh, and a question from the audience as well, is how did the tech start? Yeah, so I, I got to actually talk to the women who first um, cre who thought about this. So it was a, um, a dream of a junior league uh, from the mid-peninsula of Palo Alto back in 1978. And they had gone to see a center in, in um, uh, Chicago and they thought we need something like this here. And so it took them about 12 years um, but they were able to, to open up something called the garage. So that was the first iteration. Um, and you know, it's more of like a tinkering space. You know, that was sort of the first iteration of what that looked like. Uh, and then 1998, that's when we moved into the building that we're in now. So 130,000 um, square foot. Uh, and uh, that's when, in, and um, there was a lot of um, jockeying around which city we were gonna go to. Uh, and San Jose won, <laughs> lured us. Uh, and so um, just recently we had our, our 20th anniversary. And we originally were called the, um, the Tech Museum of uh, Innovation. And so uh, it was about for the 20th anniversary, we kind of re renamed ourselves the Tech Interactive um, to kind of emphasize how much of our, what we do is actually really, really is hands-on rather than, rather than history. It's really more like, it's the future. It's um, um, you being able to come and play and be able to explore it yourself. For sure. Um, you know, we also have a question about um, your career trajectory. Like, you know, how did you arrive at the tech? Yeah, so um, I think probably one, one of the more unusual journeys for someone to, to um, who's running a, a science center. Um, I started as a teacher. Yeah, you know, so I was a teacher as a principal. I worked in um, a district office in Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, so I came up from, you know, from classrooms. And I, um, uh, I was actually, it's sort of funny, I was a technophobe in the early days. I was one of the teachers that said, we don't need technology. This is all about relationships. And, and I, you know, I like my tables. I like my conversation. And that's how I went around it. Um, I um, went to Bermuda for three years. And while I was there, I realized that um, I, the only way I could access a lot of the resources and the experts that I wanted was using, you know, using the web. It was really be able to, you know, doing, using digital learning to be able to, um, now we're much more set up, but to be able to like have somebody zoom in. And um, that kind of opened my eyes to the fact that tech could really be an opportunity um, to like help kids who are in rural areas. Um, 
Uh, and so that kind of changed how I thought about things. And I ended up starting an ed tech company. Um, and then um, that led me into a journey where I ended up being the director for the um, Office of Ed Tech during the Obama administration. And then um, you know, still was you know, in the space. Wow. And I kept, my whole goal was always around how do I get educators talking to, to students and, and to the people who develop and make tools for us. And then it, then it was like, how do I get policymakers to be part of that conversation? And then I went to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and that's where I was really funding projects that were around, how do I bring that community voice in? You know, how do we make sure that, um, that um, everyone who should be involved uh, and those people who are closest to kids and families, um, that they were part of those conversations. And so coming to the, and I've always loved um, science. I have 22 nieces and nephews. And so um, I, that was my favorite thing to do uh, when they would come visit as I would take them to science centers or as I traveled, I would invite them to come with me. And um, I saw you know, the tech, the, a mix of all of things. You know, it's like the, the wonder and all the excitement and joy of, you know, of learning. Um, but in you know, that kind of that missing piece of the informal learning, you know, so in how do we connect all of those pieces so that we, we create a, um, a story for young people that they, you know, that, that all of the parts, pieces of their lives are actually connected together. So it was kind of a, a more unusual journey for, for me landing here, but I am thrilled to be here. Yeah, I'm glad that you're there as well. Somebody with that passion for science and museums and tech um, really seems like a great role for you. Um, you know, just a reminder, if you are watching along, uh, feel free to drop a question in the comments. Um, I do see one more as well. Uh, so they mentioned that they've seen the time capsule on TikTok and would love to learn more about that. Yeah, so this this really took off. Um, when there was a time capsule that was, you know, put together in 1990, when, we, you know, when the building opened, uh, and to be open in 2020. Um, but it actually was lost for a while <laughs> and no one could find it. But finally a volunteer had a digital copy. And so we were able to get a copy of all the videos that were created from them. Uh, and essentially people were making, making predictions about what 2020 was gonna be like. And um, you know, some of them are really accurate. They were um, kids um, wearing essentially like, you know, uh, little computers like Dick Clark kind of, um, uh, yeah, or sorry, Dick Tracy, like yeah. matches and, uh -huh. um, you know, kids learning on computers. And so a lot of these things were actually quite true. Um, there was a, 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 one of the mayors who said that, um, you know, 2020 was the best year ever. Um, he still stands by it. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, but my very, very favorite one, this is the one that I think that captured the imagination. In fact, we even ended up on, on national news on this one was a, a really lovely one where grandparents were um, talking to their grand, their future grandkids and saying, um, here's, you know, here's what we think the future is and, and what we kind of wish for you. Um, and we really? had a tape of us, you know, the, the grandkids actually listening to the, the grandparents who are no longer with us. Wow. Uh, that was like, oh, everybody was in tears you know, yeah. for, for, uh, for quite some time, but, but it's fun. And we, and if um, we, you know, people were so enamored and so engaged with it that we created a, um, you know, kind of a kit. So if you want to, to create your own um, time capsule, we have a blog post that's, uh, that's on our um, uh, Tech at Home site that gives you kind of you know, inspiration for how you might want to do that yourselves. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking, you know, you mentioned you started out as a teacher um, mm -hmm. and this pandemic has affected everyone. Um, and especially like students, schools, educators, you know, what are your thoughts on helping kids recover from that pandemic learning loss? Or if there is a gap, like, you know, would love to hear your perspective as an educator on this. Yeah, and you know, there's lots of conversations right now about learning loss. And so one, I think we can reframe some of that conversation in that um, for some kids, actually, they, this worked for them. Like if some kids were able to really soar and, uh, and then right. they need to be able. So right. some kids, it was. Um, the, what I worry about is that often happens uh, is that kids um, will end up being in, you know, like doing lots of remediation this summer. Uh, and uh, what kids really need right now is they need to like, you know, they've had a really, really hard year. Um, and all kinds of levels, you know, being more socially isolated, you know, not having the level of, um, uh, you know, just a general, like, it's, you know, it's been anxiety creating of what's happening in the world. And so young people, like, I, I've been encouraging folks to, like, to um, still do, like, you know, we, we kind of sneak in the learning, you know, for the fun activities, but, you, but it's time for kids to get outside. It's time for them to be um, being active. It's time for them to be 
um, doing hands-on kinds of learning, um, it's not time for them to be sitting in front of laptops doing lots of remediation or lots of worksheets. Um, right now, it's time to kind of recapture the love of learning. You know, make sure that's in place so that when when the kids go back in the fall, that they're um, you know, that they're more ready you know, for that piece. But that, that's how my, what, that's my take on uh, what, I, what I think parents should be thinking about this summer. For sure, yeah, I think you know a lot of silver linings um, and you know not one method works for all so really hoping that this time has been able to help those who maybe struggle in a traditional school setting um, but then also that others who uh, blossom in that setting still had the resources that they needed um, so thank you so much for sharing that um, you know I think this is a, a great place to wrap up the conversation um, so again, like, thank you so much to uh, Munira and Amr for joining and being part of uh, this discussion. Um, I hope that their story helps inspire those watching to um, learn about the Tech Interactive, visit the Tech Interactive, uh, volunteer, contribute, uh, and just be engaged. Um, so, you know, thank you, Michelle, for sharing more on the exhibits and a big thank you to Katrina as well. Um, so thank you all so much for joining. Thanks for having us. Of Take course. Care. Take care.